Today's message is from 2 Kings chapter 9, so uh, if you want to get there, you can, and you'll have a little time here to do so. I'm going to talk about uh, the Jehu spirit, but first I felt like I'm just supposed to pray over you just for a minute. Um, the enemy's always up to something, so while they're finishing taking the offering, I'm just going to take a minute just to pray over those of you that are here. Lord. I thank you for this gathering here today, Lord, and I believe with all my heart, God, that no one's here by accident. God, you've assembled people here today in this house that are supposed to be a part of what you're doing. God, a part of this church, a part of of what you are are, are doing in the city. And and God, I pray that, Lord, that just a spirit of confusion will come on the enemy and he will be unable to operate in this house. God, I pray for a supernatural focus of the spirit to fall on us. God, that break off any uh, distraction. God, I bind it. I cast it out, any distraction. But God, give us a supernatural focus so that we can see Jesus, so that we can hear Jesus and what you want to say today, Lord. We'll really just take hold and take root in our hearts. God, make the deposit that is supposed to be made today in this house. God, we all agree in this place, even right now, Lord God. We just take a moment to agree. The word of God will go forth. It will take root. God, that you will make a shift in this place. You will shift us, God, and ready us for a move of God. I thank you, Lord. I pray this over this house in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody say amen. Or yes or something, right? If you were here in January, I want to remind you, I, felt, I just felt the other day just to remind us of what happened the first of the year, because usually there's some, a declaration or something that, that goes forth, and Pastor felt the declaration of the decree over the house at the first of this year was to, the word victory. And then I remember I, I found out that the word hallelujah, which you would think that I would know this, but I thought it was just like just a praise word to say hallelujah. But hallelujah means one thing and one thing only, and it means victory. And then I thought, well, why is victory, that word, such a big deal? Because victory means this. It means that you won and the enemy lost. Okay? That means the enemy was defeated in what he's been up to in your life in strongholds in your life. You become victorious over it. That means the things that maybe you've fought for, prayed for, for years or months or whatever that be, that there is going to be victory in that and the enemy becomes a defeated foe, which is, which is critical for there to be victory. Somebody has to lose. And we want it to be the enemy. And I felt that word was critical to us and that we needed to even receive that today. Everybody say victory. Victory. Remember what this year is about. It is about the enemy being defeated. I want to remind you that what that means again. Hallelujah. Victory. Defeat of the enemy. You win. You win. So my announcement today I just felt to make is get ready. And I felt like the word just just get ready. There was something about that disturbed in my spirit to say that word. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Like with the explanation point. Like as a woohoo. Get ready. Like wake up and see things. See what God is doing. Not just see in the natural. Take a perspective that is a heavenly one. And get ready. So sometimes we don't know what's going on and we don't really see it. But we need somebody that does see it to tell us to get ready. God is about to move. And I'm telling you, get ready. I don't care how dark it's looked. I mean, I do. I, but, you know, and how chaotic it is. Don't let that influence what I'm saying here today. Get ready because God is about to move. Get ready. God is about to move. He's giving you time so that you will be ready when he moves. So that you will move with him. Because if we're not ready and we're not expecting and we're not looking and we're just looking at everything in the natural, it can be like, woe is me, everything looks bad, it don't look so good. So we get the idea that God is not about to move when it's just the opposite is what God is up to. He's about to move. So my question today is, what do I need to do to be ready for God? This is like you asking, what do, what do we need to do or what do I need to do to be ready for God? How can I prepare for God to intervene in my life, in my family, in my struggle, or in my trouble. Because if God's about to move, let me tell you, that's good. It's really good. But what do you need to do to be ready for that? So 
I want you to know that this message is not like something that's just like new to me because I've been in this for so long. I think it started sometime maybe in November that I started looking at the Jehu spirit and I just read reading through those chapters in um, 2 Kings, you know, and just kind of thinking about 2 Kings chapter 9 and, and reading and, and pondering it and then just going, feeling like it was a word, but feeling like it wasn't the right time to release that word because God has a timing for things. So there's something about me speaking this word today. And I don't know if it's just a, just a wake up call for us or, or what it is, but whatever it is, maybe you come up and tell me later, but I'm, I know that I'm supposed to speak this word and I believe this is the day that I am to release it on. And I do not think it's an accident if you're in this place. In fact, I really prayed, Lord, if there's some people that who are not supposed to be here, then just keep them away. But the fact that you are here, I'm going to assume, and you should assume that you're in this house this day for a reason to hear this word, because what God wants you to get ready. God's about ready to set things right, okay? To set things right in the people that have been going through a lot. And I think about how God works. It's always out of darkness, out of chaos, when everything appears hopeless and the enemy is like wreaking havoc when God moves and he shifts everything and there's no denying that it was the Lord. God is this God of just like, of, of, of power. You know, God is, a, if God didn't have power, then we need to get somewhere else. And, and really what, some, what Pastor was talking about there, just the, the, the loss of power in the church, the loss of belief of a supernatural power and a supernatural God. Who wants to serve a God that can't do? I want to serve the God that can do the impossible. So we see from the very beginning in Genesis, in creation, that God is this God of order. And then we see that also throughout the Bible, he's a God of order. He does things in order. He does things for a reason. It's not just random, like there's order to what he does. So in the New Testament, in John the Baptist is said to have had the spirit of Elijah on him. The spirit of Elijah, I want you to understand today, prepares the way. When God's about to do something, the spirit of Elijah comes first. You see? Think about it even then. He was the voice calling in the wilderness like they saw him as a crazy man. He was in the wilderness saying, you know, prepare the way, repent, turn around, make some changes. Because why? Because we know now Jesus was coming. God was about to move, but they didn't see it and they didn't know it. So when the kingdom comes, right, is when Jesus came. He came preaching the good news. And his message was one message really that Jesus preached, one message only maybe heard me say it before, is that his kingdom has come near. It's up to us whether or not to receive it, but the kingdom has come near. When Jesus comes, the good news is the kingdom has come near, and the kingdom is the rule of heaven. You understand? It's a form of government, right? A kingdom is a form of government, not democracy, not autocracy, but the kingdom is a form of government in which heaven rules earth. And so we receive Jesus, we're receiving the king, and we're coming into the governance of heaven, aligning our lives with the Lord so that God can have his way and move as he wishes in and through our lives. And the beauty of all of that is the blessings, the favor, and the purposes of God flowing in and through our lives. But the spirit of Elijah is one of repentance. It's a call for what is blocking to be removed. For what is in the way of the Lord, the king to come, to be removed. So what blocks a heart? What blocks a person from receiving the kingdom? It's things like this. And I want you to think about this. This is where we live every day. This, this, is, this is in people, in the church. It is in us many times, and we don't realize it. Unforgiveness, woundedness, taking up offenses against people, passing judgments about other people's motives. But what they did or whatever, what they did that for. That's passing judgments. How often do we do these things? Come on. All kinds of sins like addictions. And addictions, I thought, just had this thought, they're really false gods. Like our bad habits and our addictions are false gods. They're gods that do not deliver. They won't deliver us, but yet we keep doing them as if they're going to make us feel better. But they don't work. So they're really false gods. 
And according to scripture, when God is about to restore his kingdom, the spirit of Elijah must come to prepare the way. And those blockages and those things that are hindrances to the hearts of the people of God of receiving the kingdom of heaven into their hearts have got to be removed. So Elijah is this prophet in the Old Testament. And Hosea 9, 7 says this about the prophet. The prophet is viewed as a madman, one interpretation says. And then the, the message version says the prophet is crazy. The man of the spirit is nuts. Prophets are seen as crazy or mad and, and not angry, but wildly passionate for God like overly zealous for God. And I think that the reason why that John the Baptist was just so crazy looking and Elijah just so crazy looking is because really God was getting people's attention. They didn't look like everybody else. They didn't live like everybody else. They didn't act like everybody else. So it was just God waving the flag going, I'm about to move and I need you to get ready. Jesus is about to come and do something. I need you to get ready. So prophets prophesy. Remember, prophesying is just a pre-release of a portion of the story that God has already written in heaven. So not everyone who prophesies holds the office of a prophet. Everybody can prophesy. But the office of a prophet is appointed by God. And the prophet initiates God's activity. It initiates God's activity. Now... I understand that my office is that of a prophet. So I think today, if God gives me a word and he says, get ready, that's what people need to be getting ready because God is saying through the office of a prophet, I've got some stuff to do and I need this house ready for what I'm about to do, how I'm about to move in your life. I want to do some things in your life. I want to release the blessings and the favor of God in your life. So you need to hear what the prophet is saying today so that you can receive the release of the blessings on your life and on your family. So today's message about Jehu in 2 Kings chapter 9. Who is Jehu? Who is Jehu? The story of Jehu is found in the Old Testament in chapters 9 and 10 of 2 Kings. And Jehu, who is at this time as it begins, is just an officer in Israel's army. But he's got a call on his life that's way bigger than where he's currently at. In fact, he's to be the next king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And I believe this about Jehu, which is critical that we understand a little bit how to study the Bible, that, that Jehu is what we call a type. He's a type of Christ. Now that may sound a little strange, but the Bible uses typology to teach us things through like symbols. And so he was a kind of a representation of who Christ was going to be at some, at some point or who he's going to be at some times, so like part of the character of Christ, part of the spirit of Christ. So Jehu is a type, a foreshadowing of who Christ would be for us today of revealing how God will suddenly return and swiftly establish God's kingdom on the earth. And believe me, I do believe there's a return of Christ coming, an ultimate return of Christ. But I believe there are moves of God as we get up to that great move of God that are to happen. And there is a move of God with the power of God that is to hit this place. But God is looking for people who have made themselves ready. Ooh, ooh, let that be me, right? Yes, yes, Lord. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want you to be ready. So, 2 Kings chapter 9, starting in verse 1, Jehu is anointed to be king of Israel in this chapter. It says, Meanwhile, Elisha the prophet had summoned a member of the group of prophets. Say, get ready. Come on, get ready. Let me hear you. Get ready. Okay, let me start off, or uh, let me start over. Elisha had assembled a group of the prophets, right? He summoned a member of the group, just one, it was like a student, and he says, get ready to travel, he told him, and make this flask of oil, olive oil with you. And take this flask of olive oil. A flask of olive oil is a fairly large container, okay? A flask of olive oil. And go to Ramoth Gilead and find Jehu. So here this, here this young student of Elisha, the prophet, has an assignment to go and find Jehu, 
okay? Now, Elisha, just so you know, is a successor of the powerful prophet Elijah. And if you kind of know the story, when Elijah was taken up to heaven by a fiery chariot, Elisha was there, caught the mantle of Elijah, and received a double portion. So we don't just have power, we have a double portion power of Elijah. And he is sending his student with an anointing to anoint, that I guess a double portion anointing, to go and find this Jehu and anoint him. And it goes on to say this, he instructs, Elijah instructs this young man, said, call him into a private room away from his friends and pour the olive oil over his head and say to him, this is what the Lord says. I anoint you to be king over Israel. Then open the door and run for your life. Now, you know why he had to run? There was an incumbent king. <laughs> there was an incumbent. There was already a king. So when you get anointed to be king, should that happen, and there already is a king, like the guy who came to do it is going to split really, really fast because he knows his life is in danger for what he just did was start a coup. A coup. I mean, you know, a revolt. I mean, he just like turning everything upside down. This may be what it is, but now it's going to be this way. So he take this whole thing is about really moving fast, really quickly things happening. And I think that God is trying to tell us is some things are going to start happening really, really fast. Don't freak out. He's going to swiftly move. Things are just going to swiftly change. And you need to be ready for God. You need to be ready for the move of God. So Elijah sends this double portion anointing onto Jehu, right? Sends this young guy to go find Jehu and to run fast as soon as he do it, does it because of the danger that is involved. So we pick up at uh, verse six. The student led, leads Jehu away from the others. Smart move, being what he's getting ready to do is going to be very controversial. Verse six, so Jehu left the others and went into the house. The student called him and said, hey, let's come away from everybody else. We need to do this in private. So then the young prophet poured the oil over Jehu's head and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. Like right now, this is happening. And he tells him these instructions of what he's to do. You are to destroy the family of Ahab, your master. This is his assignment. You're to destroy the family of Ahab, your master. In this way, I will avenge the murder of my prophets and all of the Lord's servants who were killed by Jezebel. The entire family of Ahab must be wiped out. He goes on to say this, I will destroy every one of his male descendants, slave and free alike, anywhere in Israel. I will destroy the family of Ahab. Dogs will eat Ahab's wife Jezebel at the plot of land in Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then the young prophet opened the door and he ran on that note. So here we have Jehu who's just had oil poured. I mean, it's not like the little bottles down here when somebody prays for you, the man anoint you. And it's like, you know, this, you know, right? You know, just get a little speck. No, he had a flask of oil pulled over his head. So when Jehu comes back to his buddies and his friends that are sitting around, he is dripping with oil. I mean, it's rather obvious something is up when he comes. There, there's no hiding that something happened. You know, his clothes all down his head. There's this all. And it's done. Jehu barely has time to absorb the words that were spoken to him. But the anointing has come on him. And it's an anointing of power. Double portion. Elisha kind of power. They knew something had happened. In verse 11, the story goes on. The scripture says, Jehu went back to his fellow officers and one of them asked him, what did the madman want? I mean, you're dripping with oil. What did the madman want? <laughs> Is everything all right? You look a little shook. And uh, you know how a man like that babbles on, Jehu replied, kind of probably trying to brush it off. But then it says, you're hiding something. <laughs> ha, they said, tell us. So Jehu told them, he said to me, this is what the Lord says. I have anointed you to be king over Israel. They immediately, I'm being swiftly responded to the news, spreading out their cloaks and blowing their trumpets, proclaiming Jehu is king. They jumped on board with the revolt. They jumped on board with the coup. They saw movement from God and there were people ready 
that wanted to move with God. They were tired of the evil that they were living in. They were tired of just the demonic destruction, the worship of false gods. They were ready. If God's going to move in power, I want to be a part of it, don't you? I don't want to be like left behind, man. I want to be like, wait, I see the anointing all. I see the double portion of Elisha on you. I want to move with what God is doing. So they quickly moved with the spirit. And when you see God move, you got to move with it. The spirit of Jehu, the way Jesus moves, bringing justice through judgment. I think the spirit of Jehu is just this, this, the way that Jesus sometimes moves. I mean, we think of Jesus always like, you know, he was probably just walking really slow, you know, walking with the, you know, the 12, the disciples and letting everybody keep up with him. But he ain't moving slow with the spirit of Jehu. Like it's a fast, swift move of God that's happening. So it's one of justice and judgment on the enemy. It's when the enemy is defeated and he really is a defeated foe, but we see him defeated in our own lives. Swiftly, Jesus moves to rescue and restore us. Jehu is really known. I mean, you look at when up in the concordances, they use this word a lot, swiftly. He's known for swiftly acting on God's word to carry out the justice against the wicked dynasty of King Ahab and Jezebel in Israel. The writer of King notes this in 1 Kings 16. He says this, Ahab, says this about Ahab. Just so in case you feel any sorrow for Ahab about what's getting ready to come down and rain down on his family. It says this, Ahab did more to provoke the anger of God or the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. I mean, if, you, if you're going to have something noted about you in the Bible, and you, and you should be noted by God, the annals of heaven in some way, Lord, would you want it to be said about you that you did more evil than anyone else before you in, your, in, you know, in the lineage? Like you were the worst? I mean, th- this is not good. So Jehu and his platoon proceeded to Jezreel so they could do the coup to overthrow, to revolt. And as they did, the watchman, there was a watchman on the tower, tower in Jezreel, saw Jehu and the company of soldiers approaching and informs Ahab's son, because Ahab's already dead by now, Ahab's son, this is the dynasty carrying on, his son, King Joram, is now the king, King Joram. And that the first horseman comes out. So the watchman tells, hey, King Joram, to get, the, get the picture, this is how it goes down. The watchman is watching over the wall he sees a platoon coming, and they're coming fast. So there ain't, no four, there ain't no people walking on foot on this deal because you can't move that fast. There had to be chariots. There had to be horses, and they're coming in quick. So the watchman looks out, and he's like, uh-oh, somebody need to tell the king. Something is going down. Like, go, go tell the king. And the king says to, to one of his horsemen, get out there and find out wh- who's coming. And find out, are they coming in peace? God, like, get out there and get a, get a messenger out there. So he sends the first, the first horseman out to meet this platoon that is kicking up dust and riding toward their city. And, and they doesn't come back. He doesn't come back. So they didn't come back. What's going on? So then the king says, you know what? Okay. The watchman said, he ain't coming back. Sorry, he just, he just didn't come back. Well, send another one. So he sends a second horseman to go riding out toward this, this swift-moving platoon led by Jehu that's coming out. And, and he sends the second guy. And the second guy, he don't come back either. But the author writes this in 2 Kings 9.20. The watchman exclaimed, the messenger has met them, but he isn't returning either. It must be Jehu, for he is driving like a madman. Now, he's driving like a madman. And I really think he was driving like a madman because that double portion of Elijah was on him to move, to move. And he even says where he's driving like a madman. Why? I don't know. In some way, discernment, how he expected it, what it was, but but he knew God's move. There's something happening like it's happening right now. Then King Joram rides out to meet Jehu himself. But as he's going, he realizes there's trouble, and he tries to flee. But Jehu fired an arrow, which pierced his heart. So Joram's body is discarded, actually on Naboth's land, which we'll learn about later, who Ahab had brutally murdered for his vineyard, just as he had prophesied. Jehu successfully, just as it had been prophesied, Jehu successfully executed Ahab's entire family, including Jezebel, fulfilling 
a prophecy of Elijah years prior. Jehu ordered his men to kill relatives, friends, officials of Ahab's family who were responsible for encouraging idolatry in Israel. And idolatry is just meaning I'm dependent on something else other than God. And we can depend on a lot of things other than God. But always we should go to the Lord. Always we should depend on God. God, what do you have to say about this? God, what are you doing? How are you moving? Let me see you. Let me not be blinded by the God of this world. Let me see, God, you. Let me hear you. Let me be led by your spirit. Jehu kills Jezebel in 2 Kings, uh, the end of the chapter, in chapter 9. It's interesting, this Jezebel spirit. Because, because just like Elijah's spirit, or the Elijah spirit comes on people, there's also demonic spirits that come on people. And they get the name, and it, it, they, the name because it's associated and originally seen on that person. But it is a spirit, it is a demonic spirit that works. And the Jezebel spirit was working in the kingdom at that time. And it's the nastiest, evil, most disgusting, cunning, and seductive spirit. It was the spirit that was actually on Jezebel. She had this spirit on her. But that spirit still lives today, even though Jezebel does not. Jezebel's a cold-hearted spirit. You'll hear people talk about it sometimes in the church. She's responsible for destroying God's kingdom by tearing apart churches, splitting apart marriages, and ruining relationships. She's a deceiver and a liar. And I'll tell you what, people don't know when they have the spirit. They don't know when she, she's so smart. She's just intelligent, man. You, she, people don't know when they're under the influence of her. She, inf she actually at that time inspired false worship, she still does, and cold-blooded killing of God's people, and she would still kill you today if she could. This Jezebel spirit is active in churches today. She'll, let, she'll kill your spirituality if she can't kill your body. Like Satan, she is pure evil. She shows no mercy. She shows no mercy. She is the seducer of God's people, and she has seduced many. She seeks to attach herself to intelligent, attractive people with charismatic personalities. You think about that. And you know what happens is with, she's, she's prideful. So when, when, you, when you get pride, you, you can't see. Pride blinds you. Pride looks like the devil. But pride blinds you. You can't see it. You can't see when you're prideful. And then it just the pride just builds and builds and builds. And you have no idea that you are acting in pride. You can't see it. She goes after anyone in a leadership position. She gives false prophecies, visions, and dreams. And she hates prophets, she hates prayer, and she hates spiritual warfare. Because that is how she is defeated. So that Jezebel spirit, it needs to be thrown down. So here's how the story of Jehu killing Jezebel goes. The author of Kings tells how Jehu entered the city without any resistance. He saw the queen mother Jezebel watching him with contempt from a palace window. And in verse 32, it says this. Jehu looked up, he saw her at the window, and he shouted, Who is on my side? And two or three of the eunuchs, her servants with her, looked out at him, and then he says, Throw her down. Throw her down. And you know what they did? They threw her down. So the Lord is saying today, who is on his side? If you know the prophet is saying, God is about to move. And you think maybe Jezebel has been trying to work, how, trying to divide relationships that you have, trying to deceive you. That perhaps maybe God would even give a little revelation today and you would respond to throw her down. I don't want her. I don't want it in my life. If God's about to move, I don't need this. I don't want to be caught in this. I don't want to be killed by this. I don't want my spirituality to die at the hands of Jezebel, as so many have done. So Jehu commanded the palace eunuchs to throw her from the window. And Jezebel was killed. And then Jehu drove his chariot over her body. Her servants later came to bury her, only to find that dogs had eaten all of her, but her hands, her feet, and the skull. And that's how the story goes. Jehu had acted in honor. And so this, it, you know, you think, oh, that's so, that's so violent. That's so terrible. This is the enemy. This is the enemy. God hates the enemy. You should hate the devil. You should hate him. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy your family, your home, your children. 
And we need the spirit of Jehu to take him out and that Jezebel be cast down. So Jehu actually acted in honor since Jehu was behind murdering many of God's prophets, killing Naboth over a vineyard and establishing pagan temples that were forbidden by Moses' law. Don't feel sorry for Ahab and Jezebel. God sent Elijah. There was a time at which Elijah, the prophet Elijah, actually went to the evil King Ahab and Jezebel. During the days of Elijah in 1 Kings, the other book of Kings, the first one, verse 17, is a strange thing happens. Nobody's ever heard of Elijah. You don't hear of him prior to that. But in the 17th chapter of the first book of Kings, out of nowhere, the prophet Elijah rises up and he comes. He comes in that spirit of Elijah, in that anointing from God. He comes to address King Ahab and the evil dynasty. He comes there and he's, he comes on the scene and he announces there'll be no dew or no rain for years. He sends he sends the kingdom into severe famine. Three years. And you say, why would he do that? Because of the idolatry. Because of the falling asleep of God's people. And the worship of other things. And being under the sway of Jezebel and not knowing it. He comes in to prepare. Because when the spirit of Elijah comes, what's about to happen? God's about to move. God's about to move. So he comes in. The spirit of Elijah comes in. But three years later, after he calls for no rain, no dew, and they go into a severe famine, three years later, after a three-year drought resulting in just hunger and everything, Elijah returns, and he calls for this incredible showdown at Mount Carmel. And some of you guys know the story. But the, the call to the Mount Carmel was to determine who is really God. Like, where is God? Is he here? Who is God? Is it Baal, as, Jeho, as Jezebel has said? Is it that Baal? Is that God? Is, should we be worshiping someone else? Or who is God? So Elijah challenged the people in 1 Kings 18.20 on Mount Carmel. And he asked them this question. The people had gathered around from the city. The, the, the pagan worshipers of Baal had gathered. All the priests had come up there and the people of Israel and and. This showdown happens, and he asks this question. How much longer, to the people, he says, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. You know, I think the Spirit's saying that today. If the Lord is God, then follow him. Obey him, follow him. But if Baal is God or something else in your life, then follow him. Then follow that. But if, if you know there's a God... And the, and the God of Israel, if this is your God, then follow him. If it's not, then go follow whoever else is. So first the prophets of Baal prepared their sacrifice, their bowl, and they, they sacrificed it on the altar. They danced and they shouted into the evening for their God, Baal, to set the altar ablaze. And guess what happened? Nothing. Then Elijah steps up in the evening and he says, douse this altar with, fi with water that I've built. And, and now douse it again and cover it a third time. And then he says a very simple prayer asking God to reveal himself by fire to people. In 1 Kings chapter 18, 36, 37, Elijah prays, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God of blessing, by the way. You understand? This is the God of covenant. God had covenant with these people. He says to them, prove today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, oh, Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord fell on the altar. And the scripture tells us it burned up everything, like the bull that was sacrificed, but also the wood and the stones and even the dust were consumed. Case closed. Guess who is God? Yahweh is God. Our God is God. And Elijah came to prepare the way for God to begin to move again amongst his people. That's how God works. But later... 
After seeing all of that, you have to wonder, after God actually moves, after God actually moves in power and he does something in your life, after you've actually stood in his presence in this room and worshiped under the anointing, after you've actually cried tears and given yourself to God, how you can walk away under the push of Jezebel. But later when Ahab was attacked by his enemy, even though at that moment there was a turning to God, he didn't, it didn't stick. He neglected to fully obey God's commands. He didn't tear down Jezebel's temple to Baal. And he doesn't follow God's command in war and kill the enemy king when he's told to. Instead, he makes a treaty with the king. He comes in agreement with the enemy. This is a safer way to go. I'll just go in agreement with the enemy. Let me tell you, agreement with the enemy is never a good idea. And then there was Namus Nabus Vineyard, and some of you might know that story if you know your Bible well, but sometime later there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, and Ahab the king wanted that vineyard. But, he, but Naboth couldn't even rightfully give it away because it was his inheritance for the Lord, and it was against the law to sell it to the king. So he tells him no, but Jezebel arranges for Naboth to be murdered in that vineyard. And then God sent Elijah to prophesy, prophesy to Ahab at that time the tragic ending of his dynasty would come. So Elijah prophesies. I think God had just had it. You know, God, God gives grace, he gives grace, he gives grace. Even in the Old Testament, we see grace because why? God loves. God wants to bless. God wants to release blessing and favor onto your lives. God wanted Ahab to be under the covenant promises Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were, just like God wants you to be in that covenant promise with him. And then a few years later, King Ahab died from a random arrow shot by an Aramean soldier in battle at Ramoth Gilead. He was killed. The application, like here, uh, what's important to know? The spirit of Elijah comes to call people back into the right place, back into right standing. And we think of repentance as such a dirty word. Not a dirty word. It's about the love of God. The work of God in our lives can only begin once we humble ourselves and get honest with ourselves and God. Once we open up our hearts and say, God, if there be anything unclean in me, for heaven's sakes, Lord, anything, get it out of the way. Remove the way so that, God, when you move, I can move under the anointing. So I can do what you're doing. So I can be a part of the last great move of God and not be deceived by Jezebel. So it only comes to us being honest and authentic with God. Be real. God already knows your struggles. When we, don't, when we won't admit it or we get pride, I'm not struggling. I'm right. Really? <laughs> because just the idea, you would be so quick to say that you are right could be pride. And that could be Jezebel. We're holding up the process of wholeness because we won't be real with God. We won't be authentic when God already knows our hearts. We're just living denial of our struggles. And when we are in denial, we are stuck and we're not being transformed by the grace of God. And we were made to be transformed by the grace of God into this new life in Christ. But we can't as long as we won't confess. See, confession is the first step of repentance. 1 John 1, 9 says this, but if we confess our sins, our wrongs, our goofs ups, our imperfections, to him, he is faithful and just. He's faithful and just, that's who I got it. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If you skip over the confessing, then you'll never experience the blessing of being forgiven and cleansed from all wickedness. You can't just think about it in your head and that be it, you're changed, you're not. God has said, you must confess it, you must tell him. I blew it, God, I'd be stupid. <laughs> I failed to Jezebel, I'd be prideful. Like, be real, be honest, because God already knows. Joyce Myers says there's nothing about any of us that's a surprise to God. <laughs> God knows you, yet he loves you. 
and wants to be with you. How crazy is that? The Holy Spirit has come to help you get free from every stronghold, even the strongholds of Jezebel. But this work can only begin when we are willing to be real, to be honest about the struggle. Repentance starts by confessing your weaknesses to God. I be stupid, God, sometimes, and God knows it. He's so good. Admit your weaknesses. God already knows. This is how we prepare the way of the Lord. And it is critical to wholeness. It is critical to transformation. If you have been stuck, then you need to get on your knees and say, Oh God, oh God, where is it? What is it in my life? Pull it out, yank it out. Let me throw it down with you, God. Get her out. I don't want any part of her. And Jesus is like Jehu. He brings swift judgment, but it's against the enemy, not you. And our, the holdup many times is just us. Clear the way. Let Jehu come and take the enemy down out of your life. Let him slay him for your, for your own sake. The Jehu spirit, spirit reestablishes God's righteous rule in our lives and in our church and in our families. The spirit of Jehu sweeps God's house clean and sets up God's kingdom rule again, rescuing and restoring us and releasing God's promises and favor over us as we come in right relationship with him. So let me wrap up the story of Jehu with these words. Jehu became Israel's 10th king. He reigned like 28 years. And Jehu just happens to mean Yahweh is he, which is like a confession to who God is. Like this is God. God is this guy, Yahweh. This is who God is, not Baal. Jehu's name says it all. And Jehu successfully led a conspiracy against God's enemy and reigns over the northern kingdom in Israel. Jehu was known for exterminating completely the house of Ahab fulfilling the prophecy of Elijah. And what we need to understand is the relationship that God wants with you is a covenant relationship. And I think how much we don't even understand covenant. I don't know that I fully comprehend it myself, but covenant relationship has to do with promise. An agreement which brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. This is simply a promise between two parties. Like God promises to bless our lives and we promise to bless and obey him. We promise to honor him with our lives. So he said, I bless you and you bless me. You bless me and just say, God, all of me, all of me for all of you. God, if you're giving me it all, then Lord, I'll set down my pride. I'll set down my judgments against people, against pastor. I'll set down all these things and just say, God, all of me for all of you. And cast down Jezebel and stomp her. This is simply a promise. And in the story today, God's people had broken their covenant with God. They couldn't see straight. They were under the sway of Jezebel. Pride. And that's why God came to us ultimately. And Jesus, we know, is God with us. And he does all the work for us if we just confess. So my opening question was today, what do I need to do to be ready for God? How can I prepare for God to intervene in my life? Take the enemy out. Save my family. How, how, how do I? Confession. And it starts with just Repentance, it starts with confession. And that moves God's heart. That's it. It's our humility. Why is it so hard? Why does it be so hard to humble ourselves? Because that looks like Jesus. And God blesses what expresses and represents Christ. So when it looks like Jesus and is humble, he's like, pour out the blessing. But when it's prideful and it looks like the devil, he's like, I'm going to have to get rid of that guy first. I'm going to have to get rid of that Jezebel spirit. I'm going to have to get rid of that so I can pour out the blessing of God on their life. So we can be ready by renewing our covenant with God today. Because I believe that God is ready to move. We must prepare the way for him. I decree God's words in Jeremiah 31, 28 over WSF Church today. And I'll just say, you are not here by accident, so you receive this. This is for you. Don't push it off. Don't block it. Let God do what he wants to do. Do not let the enemy take you out. But Jeremiah 31, 28, and I want you to receive this as a word. You are here, not by accident. God has brought you here. It says this, in the past, I deliberately uprooted and tore down this nation. 
I overthrew it, destroyed it, and brought disaster upon it. But in the future, I will just as deliberately plant it and build it up. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now we can have one or the other. We can get ready for the blessings of God. Submit ourselves, come under the authority of God, come in the covenant with God. Be like, yes, going to let all that other stuff go. Going to be ready to move with God. Or we can get taken out. But I believe you're here today, not by accident. I prayed about who was to be in here. I really did. I just said, God, anybody you don't want to, to be in this house, to be a part of the restoration and a move of God, but anybody that you do, bring them in. So you're here, and I'm just going to assume that God brought you here strangely. It don't matter if you just walked in off the street and you don't know why you walked in. You're not here by accident. God's calling you to make covenant with him. I'm going to ask that, um, that we pray together a prayer. Maybe we'll the, just have the band to, to come and, um, and have you stand so that we kind of shift. I think what I'll do is I'll have you repeat after me. And I want you to make this a, sim, a sincere prayer of your heart because I think it's critical. These are not just words. Our words are not just words. It was words that spoke the, the world into existence. It is the fact that we speak that makes us most like the image of God. We have power to shift things by the changing the way that we speak and what we say. So let's pray this together. And you repeat after me. Lord, I want to prepare the way for you to move in my life, family, and church. I humbly confess my sins to you. I want to pause just for a moment. Close your eyes. Lord, show us. Show us how we've been under the influence of Jezebel, how we've had pride. We let pride get in our way. Show us, Lord, our sins. And God, right now, we confess them to you. Make us aware of them, Lord. Any unforgiveness in our hearts toward people, any judgments we've passed on people's motives, Lord. Any, any sins of any kind, even sexual sins, Lord, and struggles that we have that we've tried to hide. Make us aware of them right now. Bring them to our hearts and minds. Okay. God, we confess these to you, Lord. You see them. Okay, let's continue with the prayer. I'm truly sorry for my wrong behavior. I choose to forgive others. Please forgive me. Let's go on. Today, I renew my covenant with you. I promise myself to you. I ask for you to cast out the enemy who has come to destroy my life, family, and church. Rescue me and completely restore my life. Now somebody, let's shout victory in this house. We thank you, Lord. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Jesus. He is able. 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 God's about to move. Let's get ready. Let's get ready. Let's sing together here for a moment. Let's get ready. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How do I say thank you, Lord, for the way that you love, for the way that you come. For all that you've done And all that you'll do And our heart pours out Thank you You don't have to
some of you in a dire situation today and you know you need God to strike the enemy down you need God to move you need the prayer team and ministry team just come along the front I believe there's people here for prayer and it can be many things maybe addiction needs to be broken in your life but I believe you already made the first step and God can take something away in a moment. In a moment. The prayer ministry team just kind of drift on down here and, and spread out. I don't know how many of us are even here today, but if you're in this place, and I don't like to put people on the spot, so, but you know you need prayer today. I don't want you to walk out of this place without God touching your life. I don't want you to walk out of here and not be completely changed in the way that you came in. And I believe that Jesus can touch a life in a moment and shift everything swiftly. And sometimes he just moves so fast. He just so fast. And you would just say, you know what? I'm ready for God to move. I'm ready for God to shift things. I'm ready for God to, to just move and I want to move with him. So let's just give God that, that opportunity. Lord, there's some people here that really need, that need to be touched, need to be healed, need to be delivered today. And if that's you, the altars are open as we sing just one more time. Let's give a chance for people to pray. And then the people in the altars will remain here. After even the service is dismissed, they will be, there will be some that are down here. So if you need prayer, don't leave here today without prayer. And we'll just sing just a little bit longer and give you opportunity to, to respond to the Lord in this house right now. Amen. Go ahead, Anthony. You change the world. You change the world. You change the world. Oh. You change the world. Yeah. You change the world. You 
to move out of this moment so I'm not trying to stop it I mean God God is doing some stuff in this place he's doing some stuff in your life then you stay right to where you're at don't you move or you come down to the altars and see one of these people down here or you come down to the altar and do whatever you need to do you can you can kneel on the at the altar and nobody above you whatever you need to do sometimes we have to get things set up for Jehu to move we get things set up in your life we've got Jehu to move and we're looking for God to move We're not looking for hype. We're looking at the real thing. We want the power of God. We want the supernatural power of God. We want to see the glory of God. We want to see the glory of God. There's some people longing in here to see the glory of God. There's times we wait on the Lord. Let's just take a moment, God. God, show us your glory. We don't want to rush out of a moment, God, when you want to move because we, we just got other things on our mind that are more important, God. There's nothing more important than you. There's nothing that can't wait. There's nothing that can't wait, God, because you are God. And part of worship is that, Lord, there is nothing but you that matters. With nothing but you, God, you, you're all that matters, Lord. You're all that really matters in my life because if I have you, I have everything. If I have you, God, your life is right. Your life is alignment. God's life's in order. Lord, we just invite you in. We just invite you in, God. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place today. Bring our lives into a place where the blessings and the favor can flow in that covenant relationship with you, God. blessings 
and the favor of God be released. The enemy struck down. His works destroyed from our lives and our families. Never again, never again to return. Never again. And all of our days be spent worshiping you. All of our days spent committed to you. Thank you, God, for bringing us here today to commit ourselves to you, to put ourselves in covenant, to just renew that covenant, to remember that I'm promised to you and that you're promised to me. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 The altars will remain open. The auditorium will remain open. If you, if you need to leave and you're dismissed, and I just say go with the blessings of the Lord today. I bless you in the name of the Lord. If you need time in the altars, come to the altars. And that's fine as well, too. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just ask the band to go ahead and keep playing a little longer. You're good if I 